So my name is Seema Graywall and I'm a senior editor at Development and today I'm talking with Paul Wiley from the University of Oxford. Um, now Paul was supposed to give one of the plenary talks at the BSDB Spring meeting which unfortunately was cancelled. Um, so we're just going to catch up and see what he has to say. So hi Paul. Hi Seema. Thanks for taking the time to meet. Um, so let's start off with the meeting itself. So obviously we were hugely disappointed when we found out that it was cancelled but obviously under the circumstances it's totally the right decision. Um, is that a meeting that you go to quite often? Are you a regular BSDB attendee? I guess I'm a sporadic uh, BSDB attendee. So often the spring meeting unfortunately clashes with other meetings I have overseas that have been set up beforehand. Um, in this case, I was delighted to get the invitation though and to be able to speak and I planned the whole talk and I got it all set up so I was ready to go and yeah, very disappointing that it's not happening, but understandable. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm assuming, was there anything in particular you were looking forward to? Yeah, obviously I was looking forward to meeting senior colleagues and I was looking forward to giving the talk and the feedback, but actually one event in particular I was particularly looking forward to Sunday evening and my good friend and colleague uh, Tatiana Salka Spengler, who was going to receive the Cheryl Tickle Medal. Um, I was part of a nomination grouping for her and I was really looking forward to celebrating that, plus the fact that she had agreed to pay for the champagne that evening, so that would have been nice. Missed out on, on that then. Absolutely, um, yeah. Okay, so then uh, moving on to your talk itself, do you want to tell us a, a little bit about what you were planning on talking about? Yeah, sure. So I was going to split it into two parts, um, focusing on the cardiac lymphatic vasculature. We've been very interested in that over the recent years. And the two halves were really going to be some developmental work, which is unpublished, and then some work in the context of heart injury and repair and regeneration, which is published. First half, I was going to really allude to some interesting data we have on how macrophages interact with the developing lymphatic vessels, so those the tissue resident macrophages in the developing heart. And we've got some very nice data which demonstrates their requirement for the appropriate remodeling of the lymphatic vessels. And this is done by direct interaction with the macrophages contacting the lymphatic vessels, the growing tips, and causing anastomosis. So making sure that the uh, branching and plexus formation occurs normally as the lymphatics develop from um, base to apex of the heart. And we've done genetic models. We've targeted these macrophages. We've ablated them in the context of DTA targeting, so diphtheria toxin targeting. We've also looked at genetic models like the P1 mouse, which lacks all uh, the myeloid lineage. And in those um, examples, we have uh, lymphatics that don't remodel and develop properly at all. And then also in, in tune with the mouse work that I was going to present, we have this very nice human model, which is a human embryonic stem cell model in that we have um, lymphatic endothelial cells combined with labeled RFP, red fluorescent protein labeled macrophages. And in that setting, we can do time lapse imaging and observe the requirement and the contact for these macrophages to pull the growing tips of lymphatic vessels into form of plexus, which is really neat. And then we can manipulate that so we can do mechanistic studies. And in that context, we treated with an enzyme that gets rid of hyaluronic acid. We pre-treated the macrophages as a ligand that interacts with the lymphatic endothelium. And that's required for the interaction, the direct interaction. And what you see there, if you do that, is completely reduced remodeling and reduced plexus formation. So that was the first half of the story, which um, I think is what is exciting work and very much developmental focused. Yeah, the second half. I was just say, so in terms of that population of macrophages, are they, <clears throat> from a therapeutic angle, a population that you could somehow target then? Well, it's possible. It, it, it is possible. I mean, obviously, from the developmental point of view, they're absolutely required, and the tissue resident population are probably highly beneficial and they're also known to affect coronary vessel development. So targeting of those probably isn't the way forward. But what the second half of the story is actually focused more on that. Again, thinking about a, a macrophage interaction, but in this case, following heart injury and myocardial infarction. So here we've actually published the, this data whereby we know that lymphatics um, sprout and uh, undergo lymphangiogenesis after heart injury. We know that's important to traffic the infiltrating uh, monocyte macrophages, which are pro-inflammatory and also then pro-fibrotic and pro-repair as, as a distinct phase downstream. And we demonstrated that if you enhance that trafficking to the draining lymph nodes, or if you block it, you get a very different functional outcome 
for the heart as determined by magnetic resonance imaging. So if you block it, the heart doesn't do so well and the functions um, decreased and perturbed and the remodeling's increased. But if you enhance it, you get a better functional outcome, you get a preserved uh, function of the heart and you also get a much better outcome in terms of how the heart will remodel over time. And so that's the data that we have for the sort of interaction. And I would suggest there that what we can do is think about enhancing the lymphangiogenic response using growth factors or small molecule inducers and therefore enhance the trafficking. But the important point is to understand what we're trafficking when and how that correlates with the best outcome. So the idea is to profile what we've cleared into the draining lymph nodes plus what is retained in the heart in an unbiased way using single cell RNA trans you know, sequencing, get the transcriptomic, the molecular signature of these cells and understand which of those are beneficial to be trafficked at what time point to give us the best outcome. Okay. And then in terms of just trying to understand why the neonatal heart might uh, regenerate better, is that something you think it's due to a different uh, profile of macrophages or differences in the way they're traffic trafficked? Yeah, so actually we have an ongoing project that's uh, separate from the talk I was going to give that a PhD student is doing, and, and that is actually to understand what are the lymphatics doing in the context of neonatal heart regeneration, because we know from Eric Olson's work that the macrophages are essential for the regenerative response in the P1 mouse, so the postnatal day one mouse. But seven days later, of course, the mouse heart doesn't regenerate. It undergoes the normal sort of adult default wound healing of fibrosis. So we suspect the lymphatics are probably behaving differently. They're probably not trafficking at P1 when you need the macrophages in place, but they may well be then trafficking seven days later to get rid of this pro-inflammatory, pro-fibrotic milieu of macrophage response. And so the idea is that well, what, what is it that's changed about the lymphatics in that context? Is it something that's actually quite developmental? Is it the lymphatic endothelial cell junctions? Or is it the interaction? Or is it the macrophages themselves that are very, very different? And therefore, the signaling and the uptake is different. So that's what we're trying to interrogate at the moment. And that's a separate project from a Wellcome Trust funded PhD student. Okay, that sounds like a cool project. Um, and is there anything else? Any other cool, exciting projects going on in the lab right now? Yeah, we've got quite a lot going on. There's a, a, a very interesting project um, that's coming to sort of fruition around looking at the role of the extracellular matrix in heart development. And I think in general terms, the extracellular matrix in developmental biology is fairly understudied in terms of it seemingly fairly an inert substance, but it's actually obviously very important for signaling. It's highly dynamic. It's turned over during development. What we're finding in the heart is that we're focusing on one molecule which is called agarin, which sort of links the uh, basement membrane to the cell membrane, part of the glycan complex. And it was shown to be very important for uh, regeneration. It was shown to be important for cardiomyocyte proliferation. What we found working with actually the senior author of that initial paper from the Weizmann Institute, Eldad Zahor, is that agarin is really important for um, the enabling the epicardium to undergo uh, epithelial mesenchyme transition and migrate in. It's determinant of that. And we found that in agrin mutants, the heart uh, morphology, coronary vessel formation, and epicardium in general is highly disrupted. So we've been trying to understand the mechanism behind that and how that links to a role for the extracellular matrix. And one of the ways you can do that actually is ultrastructure. So you can look at the imaging using electron microscopy, and then you start to get a real sense of how dynamic and how changeable this matrix is over time. Yeah, it's definitely not as passive as I think we thought it was. Not at all, no. Okay, um, that all sounds like you've got loads of exciting stuff going on, but how, how are things at the moment with the, the pandemic? Are we, is the lab still getting by? Are you looking towards shutting down completely? Yeah, at the moment, as we talk today, the department and university haven't issued guidelines on, on closure, um, but people are, are being advised to work from home sensibly. So obviously people with symptoms, but in my group, um, no one has any symptoms, but for example, we've got someone with asthma, we have a pregnancy in the group, and those people now are, are at home working from home. So we are definitely planning to, to work from home and to, to uh, enable people to um, come in, you know, if there's a, score, a skeleton staffing or whatever, if they need to, and some of that requirement is because we've still got animals to look after and we've still got to be careful how we plan uh, anything that's ongoing with, with those, but also 
thinking about how they can log into their systems within their offices, you know, get VPN access to their PCs, et cetera, and just be able to function from home. So yeah, it is disruptive. Um, but I also think there's some benefit in, you know, people being able to sort of think more carefully about their planning their project, pause for thought about the best approaches, collect their own data, think about gaps in experiments, start forward planning for that. And hopefully if it's not many months down the line, they can then come back and, and be well prepared to, to, to get up and running again. Yeah, and I think it certainly changes the way that we think about how we sort of communicate and come together as scientists, how we do meetings and how we travel and whether or not we need to travel as often, for example. And I think for us, it's been a really good way of experimenting with this kind of thing and whether or not we can do a little bit more of this e-conferencing. So it's a, definitely some positives, I think, to be taken away from this. No, I, I think that's right. And I think that the, the issue about, you know, do we need to meet as regularly as we do? Do we, do we have to gather in, in, in large numbers? Do we have to travel as much? You know, can we cut down on our sort of carbon footprint and, 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 and have a sense of how uh, we can use social media, you know, the, the digital age around um, conferencing and, and teleconferencing, Skype calls? you know, uh, Microsoft Teams, these sorts of forums now, I think are really good. And, and in a way, this will sort of force the issue. Interestingly, yesterday, I was told that Microsoft Teams had gone down because the demand was too high. So, you know, they clearly infrastructure wise and, and, it, and it pushes the, the envelope to make sure that that's in place so everybody can access. And we've set that up and you can get up to 200 feet, 250 people on that okay. in any one sitting. So it's a, it's a hugely important forum that we will make use of for things like lab meetings, journal clubs, you know, things that keep the team engaged and keep them together. Because if everyone's self-isolating, that might be quite a, you know, depressing place to be in terms of just on your own and, and not interacting with the group, which of course, you know, the research teams, it's all about group collaborative working, so. Yeah. Yeah, so definitely some positives, I think, to be taken. Oh, sure, absolutely, yeah, yeah, has to be. Yeah. Okay, well, I think that's about all we've got time for. So thanks again, Paul, for taking the time to meet. Um, hopefully, hope everything goes well in the lab and hopefully see you in, in person sometime soon. Yeah, I hope so. Thanks very much.